Okay, so I think um, at the end of the lecture last time we were sort of ooing and aahing at how many bits the uh, compact disc audio required. It was some large number based just calculating the sample rate and the uh, number of bits of quantization. We said that a CD audio was something like when you added that there were two channels for stereo, it was something like 10 megabytes per minute. And that's about a factor of 10 bigger than what you, uh, what you, the size of the music that you download from a music service um, because of audio compression. So let's just look uh, at what, um, not necessarily that number, but let's just go through the process of what quantization is doing and why so many bits are used. Um, we had some picture showing that we had some audio signal uh, that was like some pressure wave. And it was converted with a microphone. Um, yeah, I'll draw that down. To some voltage wave. And then we had some anti-aliasing filter. Just call it AAF. And that filtered out some of the high frequencies. So maybe it now looks like this. Okay, some of the high frequencies that you can't hear went away. And then we had this step of sampling and quantization. And here was where we lose information. Um, if we sample at Nyquist, we don't lose information. Of course, we lost information in the anti-aliasing filter, but that was stuff we didn't actually care about. Um, so, let's... Um, Let's look at uniform quantization for a minute. Which is used for standard CD audio, as well as in many other cases. What that means is that every, uh, every quantization point points are equally spaced. spaced. So these, that means these are points in A, right? Well, last time we defined A as the set of quantization points. So A is just evenly spaced out. Uh, let's, 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 uh, we have some dynamic range of our signal. Suppose we quantize the signal between, for example, negative 1 and 1 as our dynamic range, here's zero. And if we used one bit of quantization, that, that would give us two quantization points. So one bit quantization uniformly, we would put the quantization points here and here. So it'd be one bit quantization. And that would mean that everything, every positive number would be mapped to this, which would be a value of half. Every negative number would be mapped to value of Negative if we have more bits of quantization, let's say two bits, then we can do um, here, 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 and here. Okay. Two bits gives 
uh, 2 to the 2 points. So we get exponentially many quantization points based on the number of bits we use for quantization. Um, okay. And if enough bits are used, then there's something interesting that happens. We want to look at um, the effect of quantizing. Okay. So quantization noise. So the effect of quantization is that we add some error in to our signal. So I think last time I defined um, E equals, um, which way did I define it? F of X minus X. No, uh, yeah, X minus F of X, where F of X is the the result after quantization, all right? And um, let's look at, um, let's look at how large E can be when we um, do uniform quantization. Okay, so E is bounded by, in the example above, um, the absolute value of E can be no bigger than, I'll stay right here and I'll use this, can be no bigger than the interval of all the points um, that map to, the, to that quantization point divided by 2, right? So what is the width of that interval? Um, well, we started with a, a total width of 2. So if we um, use 0-bit quantization, everything maps to 0 and we would have error bounded by 1. Here, what we, once we, now that interval gets divided by 2 to the b, so this ends up being uh, 2 to the negative b. Okay, so that's the largest error. So we can verify that in the case of 1 bit, uh, the largest error we could have was, uh, we could have an error of a half, and 2 to the negative 1, that's a half. Okay. So this is the largest error we get, less than. All right, so it turns out that, um, let, me, let me draw a signal and draw the, the uh, quantization noise just to give us some idea what we're talking about. So if here's an actual signal, and if we had sampled that signal um, at uniform points in time at the Nyquist frequency, then the samples of this signal might be something like the following. Okay, so these are samples at the Nyquist frequency. And then let's imagine we quantize, and just since I have a nice lined paper, I'm going to assume that these lines are exactly my quantization points. Okay. So now we do quantizing, and we end up with something like this. That gets rounded to the nearest line. This gets rounded to the nearest line. Boy, it's already on a line. This one gets moved up there. This one, uh, that's kind of close. I'll go down. This one's here. Uh, that's already on the line. Yeah, that's on the line. Okay, so I got lucky on some of them. All right. Now, that means that um, this green sequence of points is, my, is the quantized signal that I store in memory somehow. All right. Now, uh, there's some error, and let's draw the error uh, here. So, blue is our x of n after quantizing. And the green is, oh sorry, that was green. Green is x of n after quantizing. So the error is the difference between the blue and the green. It's how far above the green the blue one is. So the error in the first case, um, 
sorry, so error we're defining as the blue minus the green. Okay. Uh, uh, in my notes last time, I'm pretty sure we had this reversed way, so I'm going to keep it reversed. The error is f of x minus x. Okay. So we take the green minus the blue. So we get something like this, this, My uniformly spaced points are not very well uniformly spaced. But. This is our E of N. OK. And what we've effectively ended up with is our original signal. If I rearrange the equation up there, I have that um, what we stored, F of x of n, by definition, just equals x of n plus e of n. And we can consider this part our quantization noise. So we've effectively added some noise onto our signal by quantizing. All right. Now, um, what's interesting is that if the quantization is fine enough, then this noise becomes uncorrelated with our original signal. Um, And it also becomes uncorrelated from one sample to the next. Okay. Now, none of these are strictly true in general, in, in the sense that is actually just a function of x. I mean, it's not independent of x in any way. But uncorrelated doesn't imply independent. Um, so they become, uh, as the quantization gets fine enough, these become uncorrelated with x and uncorrelated with each other. Uh, we call that white noise when they're uncorrelated with each other. Has the property that it's the, the signal spread evenly across all frequencies, roughly. Okay. So, what we want to know now is what is the um, power of this noise? How noisy is it? All right. So, the noise power is going to, uh, we, we calculate that as the variance of the noise. All right. So, in, when you get in the statistics and probability, then our definitions of power correspond to uh, variance. And I'll give you the answer. You don't have to know how to calculate variance. But it turns out, um, one more thing to add to this list of what happens when quantization is fine enough. Uh, EN becomes uniformly distributed. Um, over an interval that's of width over its entire dynamic range. So um, uh, let's say OK, so without any bits, the, the maximum error So you've taken the, the uh, dynamic range of your signal, and you've divided it by 2 to the b. And it turns out the error is equally likely to be anywhere in that interval. So it ends up looking uniform.
in other words, if we did this to many different signals, what I'm saying is, in this quantization case, the error can't be more than a half, right? So for each of these, we have a limit. The error couldn't be more than, uh, let me make that a different color. <coughs> The error was bounded that it couldn't be more than a half here. And it couldn't be less than negative a half. And in fact, it's going to be distributed to be equally, uh, statistically, it'll equally occur in this entire range, equally often. All right. So that means that the noise power is um, one twelfth two to the negative two b. We square this dynamic range and divide by twelve. Now, in our case, the dynamic range started at two, a width of two. So, for using this example then we would take 2 over 2 to the b. So it would be uniform 1 twelfth 2 to the 2 b minus 1. Okay. So this is for the example above. So that, that um, this minus 1 comes from the fact that we just started arbitrarily with the width of 2 rather than with the width of 1. Okay, actually, no, it's not 1 twelfth, it's 1 third. Sorry about this. So what we're doing, um, I didn't necessarily want to work this out, but to calculate variance, you do an integral of the distribution times the x squared. Yeah, no, sorry, this is 1 12th. Leave it at 1 12th. Yeah. Okay, so this just comes from the uniform distribution. All right, so we can see that if we use few of bits we get it's like we added in some noise now what does this is white noise I said um, has anyone ever heard white noise through a speaker know what it sounds like I mean it's just noise that's equally spread out at all frequencies it's just kind of like a, a <laughs> sound and that you know yeah maybe a s better you get more of the high frequencies in there so so this is what's being added and you don't want to hear that in your CD audio. So the idea is B is big enough that this noise power, the volume is very small and you don't hear it. All right. And if you make the number of quantization bits larger, then you get even less, less noise. But this is noise that's going to occur because you're quantizing. So it has to occur to some degree. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> So, um, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> now, let's see. In the end, what you're concerned with is a signal to noise ratio. How loud is your signal compared to your noise? Because you can always adjust the volume knob, right? Um, and you have a homework assignment to calculate that in your problem set. Okay. Let me just go through um, briefly and explain how uh, compression can work. Because as we've seen, this results in a lot of bits. Okay, you get good quality sound. But there are tricks to doing compression and use a lot fewer bits on the order of 10. 
few, uh, a factor of 10 bits less here and still get great sound quality. Um, so I'm not going to go over how audio compression works. It's a little more complicated than image compression, but let's just talk about JPEG for a minute here and how that works. And I know you were exposed to this in one of your labs. Um, so, um, oh, yeah, okay. There's one, one thing that I forgot to include before we get to JPEG. Let's talk about now non-uniform quantization. So we mentioned how to do what uniform was. Now, why might we do um, something that's not uniform? Any ideas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me draw a little um, diagram of a distribution. Let's say here's our value of x. And if we look at the statistics of our signal by looking at many of the samples, we find, let's say, that they're not evenly spaced. Here was our dynamic range in that example. I'll keep that fixed, that our signal's in this range. And, but suppose that it, that we find something weird that they're, that most of our signals are, most of our samples are occurring up towards the top of this range. Now maybe for audio that doesn't make sense, but for other things like images that makes a lot of sense that you maybe get many more of your pixels at some certain saturation level. So it, so the error we get from uniform quantization, we can reduce that error if we quantize in a different way. So what we would generally want to do is put more of our quantization bits. Let's say we have three bit quantization. That gives us eight uh, points to place. Now if we place them non-uniformly, we would want to put more over here where the um, signal occurs more frequently. Put them closer together and then maybe spread them out where it's not occurring very much. Something like that. Um, now why would we want to put them closer together where it's more frequent? And the reason is that when we look like we did before at the optimal way of mapping the signal to the quantization point, um, we're going to get narrower intervals, of course, where we have more quantization. And what that means is we'll get less error in general in these, in these regions than we do, let me say, in these regions over here, we'll get less error than we do over uh, in these intervals where we're mapping a wider interval to one quantization point. Okay. And to calculate the frequency, like how often that quantization point is used, that's a calculation that involves uh, looking at the area under this uh, frequency curve here, under the distribution function, the density function. And that will tell us how frequently that quantization bin is used. And we see that um, we want the uh, smaller quantization bins to be used more often, and that's what we end up achieving here. Here, you get less frequency of using this quantization bin. Um, unless you make the interval really wide. So you could optimize how you place these points to minimize the average amount of error that you have. All right, now there's one other thing you could do um, to save, uh, if you have a non-uniform signal, there's another way to get efficient quantization uh, with meaning the, the trade-off between your quantization noise and your number of bits you use we want to make that a good favorable trade-off. We want to use few bits to get small noise. There's another another way to approach this. Um, can anyone think of what else besides uh, changing where the quantization points are? You can use the two ideas together as well. Yeah. Oh, like first map the um, the signal using some function that spreads out the distribution. Uh, yeah, that's that's an idea that that will end up being equivalent though to replacing these quantization points, I believe, because you can find where the new boundaries are, 
So that would be another method for doing what ends up being the same thing. Yeah? Okay, so maybe use that as your per, as your guidelines for how to set these quantization points is to get equal area. Um, that seems intuitively like a good idea, although that might not, I don't think that's actually going to be optimal in the end um, as far as the optimal placement of these points. But there are algorithms that will converge to an optimal placement of quantization points. But there's another idea altogether, and that is do um, compression after quantization. In other words, not all um, not all quantization points must be the same length code. So normally, what we with let's say let's go back to uniform quantization. Normally, it's pretty straightforward. How you once you've quantized, how you represent those with bits. You just assign each quantization point a bit sequence up to b bits, and we know that we've got two to the b such sequences. And so, it, you can just go across from the lowest to highest. That's the the typical thing to do. You just make that be. Um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, or something to that effect. Very easy. You assign everything out equals length uh, bit sequences. However, we've talked about Huffman codes and how we can save by using unequal length bit sequences. So what you can do is a Huffman code on the quantization points. You know, assign one of them um, uh, 0 and another one 1, 0, another one 1, 1, 0, 1, and so forth. And I'm not... Maybe I'll make the long ones over here just for illustration. And you assign things different lengths. Okay. Now, even if you had had just used uniform quantization, this gets you a lot of the savings back that you lost by doing uniform quantization. Because now the fact that your distribution is non-uniform will make some of your quantization points much more likely than others, which allows you to get out some compression. Okay, so you could do both. You could you could put the non-uniform quantization and then follow it by compression. Um, it's um, but in in both JPEG and I, in JPEG they do uniform quantization, but then they follow it with compression. Um, in MP3, I don't think it's uniform, but still most of the savings they're trying to get after they quantize by compressing. Okay. Um, So what this will do is it doesn't change the amount of quantization noise, but it reduces the number of bits you needed. So as you're designing, you could have designed for a finer quantization to get lower noise, and maybe you're not spending as many bits as you think because you then get to compress. So for illustrative purposes, I'll run through some of the steps of JPEG. Um, and how and how they're actually getting savings in an image uh, compressing with a smaller number of bits. So first of all, color is in three dimensions. Now I say it's three dimensional, but I'm going to qualify that because in fact color is infinite dimensional, but according to the human eye, as perceived by the human eye, so the reason for that is because our eyes have three different color sensors. Uh, three nerves that are sensitive to two di three different um, spectrum of light. And so uh, we only can observe color three dimensionally. We can represent the colors we observe with three primary colors. Um, typically, this might be done with something like red, green, blue, 
Or sometimes you say you have another set of primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Um, red, green, and blue is actually matched pretty well to the eye. But anyway, many there are many basis, vec uh, basis vectors. There's many basis to represent the three dimensions of color that we can see. All right. So one of the first savings that JPEG can get is they optionally do the following. They co first convert color into a different three-dimensional representation. OK, and what this is is the Y has to do with brightness. And the C, B, and C, R have to do with the blue and red uh, offsets to get you to the right color. So for any one pixel, uh, you have to represent a, in a color image, any one pixel is represented with three numbers, but there's many ways to do it. You could have just said how much red, how much blue, how much green to illuminate. And you could also represent it some other way where you kind of separate out the brightness. So the first step where JPEG can get some savings is splitting it this way and then down sample by a factor of two. So they can down sample the color uh, portions of it. Now this is based on knowledge of the human visual system. And that is that you're much more sensitive, uh, you have a better resolution of sensitivity for brightness and you'll notice brightness being incorrect. Um, but you don't have a, uh, the color, getting the exact color right, you're not as sensitive to. In, as far as, in, in other words, you don't um, need such high resolution uh, of color sensitivity to enjoy the image. But you need the, you need the brightness resolution. OK, so um, when you downsample, as we talked about, you, always, you first do an anti-aliasing filter and then you downsample, which means you're always going to lose the high frequencies. So essentially, what this means is that the color image, the, these two, uh, um, you know, the, the two dimensions having to do with color are saved at a lower resolution. Okay, and then they, when they're displayed back to you, they're just blown up. But the brightness is saved at full resolution. All right, so that's one way to get some savings. But then. After doing that, each of these three are processed the same way. Um, so then for each Y, C, B, C, R, they're split into eight by eight pixel blocks. All right, and um, and each of these eight by eight, eight pixel blocks is processed separately. And here's what happens: you do a discrete cosine transform. This is very much like the DFT. In principle, just think of this as a DFT. It's sort of for technical reasons that you do the DCT. All right, now. Um, so what, what have we done? We've split it into frequency components. Now, so you end up with an 8x8 eight eight block where the low frequencies are up here. And the high frequencies are spread out around here. High frequencies in different spatial directions. All right. Now, what, what does this step buy you? Well, what this gets you is it separates the correlation
So for one thing, it takes advantage of the correlation structure and ends up representing the signal in a way where each of these coefficients are roughly independent of each other, so compression will work more efficiently. We discussed that if you're doing, for example, lossless compression with Huffman codes and you have a signal that's correlated, um, you potentially can compress much better if you, uh, if you compress the longer sequences of the signal together, but that's not always a, um, that's not always a practical thing to do. So uh, what's actually done with images and with, with audio is you transform it into a domain using the Fourier transform where you no longer have to worry about co correlations among the different coefficients. You've already wrapped that up into this new representation. Okay, the other thing is this. Now they take advantage of uh, more knowledge about the human visual system, and that is that you're not going to be as sensitive to high frequency noise. So as we now get to the step where we're going to quantize, um, we're going to, uniform quantization is applied to each pixel. But a different uh, granularity is used for each pixel. Okay. So for the low frequencies, uh, they get much better quantization, so more bits are used. And less quantization noise. And for high frequencies, the opposite. So you, you end up quantizing the high frequencies much more granularly. Um, even to the point where a lot of these, this is an 8 by 8 <coughs> set of coefficients, and a lot of the high frequency ones are quantized so coarsely that they're just rounded to zero. Okay, so you end up with a whole lot of zeros in most of these 8 by 8 blocks up here at the high frequency. Okay, and then the last step is lossless compression. Now, we already talked about lossless compression, uh, that we could use a Huffman code to get optimal lossless compression. Um, but if we want to do lossless compression optimally here, um, we're going to, one way to do it would be a, construct a Huffman code on this entire 8x8 eight eight block. So take every possible quantization of this 8x8 eight eight block and make a Huffman code for it. Now, that would that would do it, but it would be very impractical. It's very uh, m too much work to design such a huge Huffman code. All right, that would that would um, assign each uh, instance of eight by eight quantized coefficients to to some Huffman code. So it's done in two steps for practicality. Um, first, a run length code is used, and then a Huffman code. So run length code is the following. Let's just talk about a run length code for a minute here. If you have a signal that's, has, that's going to repeat itself many times in a row, for example, Okay, and I want to represent this in, in as few bits as possible. Um, a run length code is basically a process that counts how many you have and encodes, somehow encodes the following. Something like zero, seven times in a row, uh, one, eight times in a row, zero, nine times in a row, and one, four times in a row. Now, in reality, there's going to be some protocol for how to actually encode this in a way that can be read. But that's the, the main idea is you just 
say how many times you get the same symbol in a row. Now, run length codes um, work well, like I said, if you have long runs. Um, if you don't, they can actually be longer to store than the original signal itself. Um, but what happens in the in JPEG is you because you have so many zeros up here in the high frequencies, they read out the coefficients in a zigzag order, like this. And when you read them that way, you're likely to get a lot of zeros at the end. All right, and so by doing the run length code, you cannot have to store all those zeros. You can just say, okay, the rest are zero at some point. All right. Once that's finished, then a Huffman code is applied to actually get some nice compression out of this. All right, so that's the main idea. Now, like I said, Huffman code, the, there's a fundamental lower limit for, for lossless compression. That's the entropy of the signal. Run length codes obey that same limit. Huffman codes obey that same limit. So it's not like run length codes can actually uh, get you more savings than, than, than Huffman codes. It's just that um, they're very simple for this particular signal to apply them first, and which will then allow you to build a much smaller, more practical Huffman code to try to get the rest of the savings out. Okay, so that's the main idea. Uh, that's, that's what happens in JPEG. Um, now, MP3, which, which uh, you may get more experience with in the lab coming up, um, MP3 is uh, similar but more complicated. Um, so audio compression is more complicated because unlike vi visual compression, um, for image, it was known already that high frequencies were not as important. Okay, so we could get, we could quantize them, get a lot more quantization error in the high frequencies, and not be too annoying. In the uh, the audio system is more complex. There's not just some range where you can throw a bunch of quantization noise. Um, and get away with it. So for the audio system, what for uh, what you actually do is you have to first identify um, tones, loud tones that are going to mask neighboring frequencies, and then you you use fewer bits around those loud tones in the neighboring frequencies because you know that all the quantization noise there won't be perceived. Uh, it'll be masked by this loud tone. But it's a more complicated process to go through and find these spots where you can where you can get away with using less quantization. All right. Let's take a two minute break. Okay. Let's go back here. All right, we're going to move towards um, we're going to move towards the topic of uh, another topic related to information. Um, the topics we've been talking about the last couple of lectures have diverted from the main sort of theme of the uh, course where we're, we've done most things centered around the Fourier transform. We were able to see the Fourier transform helps us understand modulation, helps us understand sampling, very important concepts. And here we're doing other things and maybe it feels sort of like a, a collection and uh, I, I think it can be. It's not meant to be overwhelming that we're throwing in all these different topics related to information. It's meant more to be uh, kind of uh, exciting that we're touching on all these cool discoveries and uh, little bits of theory that, that are so relevant related to information. Now, next time we're going to go back, and unless I don't finish this topic this time, uh, we'll, we'll end up back with things that look more like Fourier transform signals and systems. Um, but I'm going to continue on with some very cool uh, results related to uh, information, and we'll, we'll talk now about error correction c codes, a little bit about secrecy. Um, so that's what we're doing now. All right, so first thing is we're going to talk now about how do we deal with um, 
errors that can be introduced into a, a message that we have recorded as bits, let's say. How can we, uh, you know, if we transmit some, uh, an email or some message um, across some noisy environment, uh, how do we know it's going to be received correctly? What do we do about noise? Now, you experience this every day. You use, there's Wi-Fi being used right now. There's cell phones. And um, when you send, say, an, uh, an email or you send some photo to a friend, you know that you probably are aware that this is going through very chaotic, noisy environments to get to the, the uh, antennas that receive the signal. And then even still dealing with noise, there's possibilities of packets being dropped across the internet and so forth. And yet, you always expect your photo to get there intact, and it always does, right? Um, it doesn't just end up close, it's exactly what you sent. And so we're going to talk about how that happens here. Um, so the first idea is this. Well, here's, here are the things we're going to talk about with um, detection, error detection and correction. The main ideas are parity check, and then we'll look at some examples of some codes. Hemming codes and uh, Reed Solomon codes. All right. So here's a simple one bit error detection scheme. Okay, so start with some information bits. Okay, so I'm going to draw seven information bits here. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to add, so we have seven information bits. Could have as many as you want here. We're going to add one parity bit. Okay, so this is redundancy. It doesn't carry any extra information. Uh, one bit. But what I've, the way I chose how to assign this bit is I made the parity of the whole sequence be even. And what that means is the number of ones in this sequence is even. Okay. Um, So I can write that mathematically, that the parity bit P is equal to the sum of all the other bits mod 2. So what this means is mod 2 means after you've added everything up, it means take out all multiples of 2. You just look at the remainder, okay? It's a very useful um, mathematical operation used a lot for, especially for these types of codes. Um, and so you see that when I added up all of those other bits, I, I got four. Four mod two is just zero. So I set the parity bit to zero. Now by doing this, you're always going to make it so that when you add the parity bit in with the rest, if you look at the entire sequence, it's always going to be zero mod two. It's always going to have an even number of one. Right? So um, so the detection is very simple then. The detection for an error is just add up all of the bits plus the parity mod 2 and if it's if it's 0 then you say I don't think there's an error and if it's 1 you know for sure there's an error. Okay. Now this will detect uh, one error. Uh, what about two errors? Okay, so 
what happens in the case of two errors? Yeah? Okay, when will they cancel out? Yeah, and in fact, yeah. Yeah, it'll always cancel because even if you change two zeros to ones, yeah, you, you change the sum, but you don't change the sum mod two. And the decoder just knows to check the parity. So any two errors will pass. Yeah? What happens if the parity is changed? Uh, that's okay. Um, it's still to check the error. The only way that the, the only thing the decoder is going to know is whether there's an error or not. If the parity bit changed, then when he does this operation here, um, he's going to calculate one because he adds in the parity, right? So he'll calculate that there was an error. Now it turns out that the error was not significant to him, but he, but the decoder doesn't know that. The decoder just knows there's an error. All right. So so once you've put in the parity bit, then it's checked with everything else for an error. Okay. So if there are two errors, then it passes. So that's so you can't detect more than one error. Now, what if there were three errors? What about three errors? What? Well, it detects an error, so that's all that matters. It, it'll detect an error if there are three, or if there's any odd number of errors. Okay. But it's not going to detect every possible situation. Any even number of errors, it won't. So we call this a single error correcting. It'll correct up to one, guaranteed. All right. Uh, not correcting, detecting. OK. So here's the catch. By adding redundancy, we can Correct errors. I should say more redundancy. We already had some redundancy there, and that allowed us to detect an error, but not correct anything. We don't know where it is. Okay. If we add more redundancy, we can actually correct them. I remember being fascinated when I first learned this. That how can you actually correct the errors? You know, go in and figure out where they are and switch them back. But that's what we can do. And there's a very simple example that um, maybe someone can think of how you could build a, in enough redundancy that you could correct an error. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and give, give the simplest case. So here's OK, you could just repeat. So repetition code just repeats each bit a certain number of times. Now what we'll do is we'll say how many times you repeat it. Often we will say like three one. Here I'll say. For codes, often you say how many bits does it become, and how many information bits are there. So we're going to repeat each bit three times for the three one repetition code. Why is this error correcting? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if you decode to the majority, then you'll correct up to at least a certain number of errors. In this case, you'll correct up to one error if you decode to the majority. So. So in general, you can um, you can repeat any odd number of times for repetition code. All right, so we see that that's one way to correct errors. Now let's look at something a little more interesting. It's this thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's it's uh, it's absolute. It's every time. Okay, so every bit you send, you're going to turn into three bits. You're you're changing the length of your message by multiplying it by three, as far as how much storage it requires or transmission it requires. Um, I'm not sure if I exactly understood the what you're, the distinction you're making between relative and absolute. Did that answer your question or? Yeah, okay, do you want to go again at it? Yeah. Both. I mean, you, re you repeat the use of this code on every bit that you're trying to send. So, yeah. Why do you specify the one? Because there will be other codes, not repetition codes. Uh, for repetition, you don't need to specify the one. Every repetition code is a one. Okay. But for other codes, you'll have other numbers there. All right. So, like my, the example I'll, I'll have here. But that's right. In repetition codes, it's meaningless. It's always just one bit of information. Okay, so um, all right. So let's just um, let me just uh, write what we already said in the little table here. Uh, we had information. Oops, information. So if we have information that's zero or one, then what we actually transmit. Or if it's just memory, then we store this 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. This is the 3, 1 Hamming code. And this would correct up to one error. And it has a rate. And by rate, we mean how much was transmitted, how much actual information was transmitted divided by the total number of bits used for this code. Okay, so we have. One, so we have R equals one third here. All right, so we're, we're our storage to be more efficient. You want less redundancy. You don't want R to be small. But to correct errors or detect errors, you actually have to add redundancy into your information. So let's look at um, this was the three one code. Let's look at the five one repetition code. So we, again, we have two pieces of possible information here, and we transmit uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and here we can correct up to two errors. And the rate of this, though, went down, r equals 1 fifth. Okay. Let's look at something a little more sophisticated. These are called Hamming codes. So Hamming codes, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, it's, a, it's a whole collection of codes. Okay, and they can each correct exactly up to one error. Okay. Um, so actually, the repetition 3-1 code is a Hamming code. It's the simplest one. Let's look at the, the next interesting one here. Hamming seven four code. Okay, now to describe how this works, this is a very fun one to describe because you can do it with a diagram. So here's a diagram that will explain how this code is going to work. All right. I have three circles dividing up seven regions, and I'm going to put little labels here. Okay. 
D1, D2, D3, D4, P1, P2, P3. And what I mean by this is D is our data, our, our actual information, and P are then things we calculate. They're the parity checks. So this is a 7-4 code. What that means is four bits of information. of information uh, out of seven total bits that are going to be written. Okay, so th therefore the rate R equals four sevens for this particular code. Okay, so the way we do it is this. You fill in the data however you want. Zero, one, one, one. Okay. Um, you write, you write the data, and then we do a parity check on each circle. So I'm going to put a, set the bit here so that we have an even number of ones in this circle. That means I have to put a one here. Right? Now up here, I have to put a zero to make this an even number of ones. And then finally, I look at the last circle. What do I have to put there? A zero. Okay, so those are my parity check bits. Now, how does this correct a single bit error. Well, any error, there are seven possible places to put the error, but they're going to affect, they're each going to affect a different number of the parity checks. Okay, if I have no error, then all the parity checks come out correct. But if I have an error in any of these outer parts here, in any of the parity bits, they're only going to affect that one parity check. Okay, if I have an error in one of these three spots, then that's going to affect two parity checks, and they're each a different set of two. And if I have an error here, it affects all three. So afterwards, by, by looking at the three parity checks, I can identify exactly which spot has the error, assuming that I have no more than one error. Okay, assuming I have either zero or one errors, I can always correct it. Um, now, someone who, uh, who, who understands this scheme? Raise your hand. Okay, go ahead and go out. <laughs> no, I need a volunteer. Will you volunteer? Uh, you can you can go out of the room, and we're going to write something here and put in an error, and you're going to then decode what the, what it is. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. I was just wanting to put someone on the spot. Okay. So um, what I need now, I'm going to erase these things. Okay. So first of all, someone's going to come, right? I need three volunteers to help me out. Just three people come on down, and we'll at least do a different role here. Okay, we've got one, two. Okay, one more. The error injector. This, that, that role's not, not too bad. Okay, so here we go. You can use green. Just You'll write in just four data bits, so you have that easy job. You just put in whatever you want. You'll come and you'll calculate the parity. And then you will put an error wherever you want. So the parity checks on the three circles, right? So yes. this should be zero up here, and then one here and zero there. Okay. <laughs> no, no talking out loud. They'll hear you from the hall. <laughs> Okay, looks good. We all ready for this? Let's have our volunteer come back in from the hall. What? Go ahead and tell them to come back in. Oh, you did? Okay. All right, so here you go. There, there's zero or one errors, and I want you to just tell us the data, the D1 through D4, how it, after correcting. Wait, sorry, what do you want me to tell you? Well, you can tell us the whole thing, or you can just tell us D1 through D4. Okay. Uh, D2 and P3 are wrong. P1 appears to be right, so I'm going to guess D3 was flipped. Okay, great. You're right. You're right. Excellent. All right. And once you know where it is, you can just 
flip it back and read your data out correctly. Okay, so let me give you the general Hamming construction here. Um, what you're doing is this. In our case, there's a there's a let's write out these um, in a, in an order that looks confusing, but is actually going to be nice here. So what if we write our bits p1, p2, d1, p3, d2, d3, d4. It really doesn't matter what order you you write these in, as long as you know what order they go in. But the reason I did that is because I can now illustrate for you how the parity checks work in a table here. And say here, with X's, I'm going to mark the parity checks. So there's a parity check on every other um, bit. If you look at this circle, that corresponds to this circle up here. This circle up here, I just put an X on all of those down here. Let me do the next circle is like this. And the final circle is this. Now the reason I wrote them in this order is because there's a pattern here. And that is, so you can check that I copied these down correctly. Um, but So that means that everything that has an X in a given row has to have even parity. Okay, we have three parity checks for this for this code. Um, but in general, you can have a Hamming code that has um, for any uh, sizes that can be written in the following way: two to the let me use m two to the m minus one. Let me get rid of that And um, the number of parity bits will always be m. So we'll have information bits will be 2 to the m minus m minus 1, where m is an integer. So the 7.3 code was m equal 3. 7.4 code, sorry. OK, and these will always, you can always construct such a Hamming code, it'll correct one error. Now, um, now, how do we get the, the? How do we generalize this construction? Well, notice what the pattern is. We have a parity check, first of all, on every um, power of two. So here, the first bit is a parity check. Second, fourth. So the next parity check would be the eighth bit. And the parities follow the following pattern. Here is every other one. The next one is you go two, and then off two, on two, off two. The next one's on four, off four, on four, off four. So if we wanted to go to the next bigger Hamming code, we put a parity check here. Let me do it in blue. P. And then we put a bunch of data. We'd put seven more pieces of data here. And then we would, do, we would make a parity check on all of these last eight. And we would continue out the pattern on the other ones. Every other one, so forth. Every other two. And every other four. Right. Okay. So, and that, and this is always going to be single error correcting. So, what? Let's compare this. Um, the Hamming seven three seven four with the repetition code. Okay. So compare. And repetition three one. All right. Well, here we have r equals four sevenths, and here we have r equals one third. So we get a better rate from the Hamming code. However, they're both single error correcting, and it's if we have a given. Let's assume that each bit has a given probability of of having an error. Well, the Hamming code is longer, so it's it's more likely to have two errors than the short repetition code. Okay, so this has better error protection. Let's calculate that out. So, 
suppose that um, suppose each bit has error with probability p e. Okay. Or p b, I'll say for bit. It's a bit error probability. P b. Okay. So what we have is for the repetition code. Probability of error uh, is going to be there are three ways to have two errors. Okay, so what we basically need to do is calculate how many different ways are there of getting errors. We could have two errors or we can have three errors in our block of size three. But there are three different ways to put two errors. So we have to count each of those separately. Three times probability of uh, a sequence with two errors. for any particular sequence with two errors, plus one way to get three errors, three errors. So for any particular sequence with two errors, the probability of getting that was PB squared times one minus PB. That means two bits in error and one bit correct. Okay, and then plus PB cubed. So this is the probability of error for the repetition. For Hamming, we do something similar, although we don't want to brute force it like we just did. There's too many ways to get two or more errors out of seven. So what we do here is we say P of error is one minus the probability of all of the ways to get it correct. Okay, So we can count the ways of getting it correct much more easily. There's one way of getting no, no errors. That would do it. So probability of zero error minus, and then there's going to be now seven ways of putting a single error. Okay, there's seven instances of one error, so seven times probability of any one error sequence. So that equals one minus, and this is just one minus PB to the seven to get no errors seven times. And this is minus seven times a single error, PB, and six non-errors. Okay, we can approximate this. Let me just give you an approximation. This is this here is approximately 21 PB squared. But I can also just calculate it exactly and just give you a comparison. if. PB equals 0 0.01, then I can do a little chart here. Here's the rate. Here's the probability of error. For the Hamming code, we have a rate of 4 sevenths, and we end up with an error that is exactly. Um, Point oh oh, so it ends up being zero point zero zero two oh three, and for the uh, repetition, it ends up being much much smaller at zero point zero 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 two nine eight. We'll continue this on next time. We're out of time. No. Oh, how much information you get per bit you have to Okay, so you know you, you, you turn every bit into three. Whereas in Hamming you turn every four into seven, that's not quite as good. Depends. What do you care more about, rate or error? So we'll we'll continue this on next time and make some sense out of it. Uh, it will give you less error. Well, for that particular...
per thing between the repetition and the hammy, then repetition will give you less error. You can come up with a better, do a longer repetition, you'll get even better error protection, right? You know